she can hear me. Awesome. So let's go ahead and jump in. So Brianna Pardo, you are the Director of Digital Engagement at Geisinger. We are so, so, so excited for your presentation today. I was going through your deck um, on Monday and the content that you're sharing similar to Noah is so refreshing because both of you are willing to really pull back the curtains and share some things that really um, make you a little bit vulnerable, right? Like a lot of people pretend or like to pretend that everything within the organization, their team is perfect. Our data is perfect. Our analytics are perfect. We're measuring things that you're not measuring. Um, so it's awesome to actually have people be willing to say, actually, data is messy, processes are hard, teams are difficult to wrangle. So um, I am really excited for this presentation. A quick little reminder of format. We're going to go until uh, for the next 40, 45 minutes of brief presentation. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section down below. I'm aggregating them. And we'll have time to do Q&A with Bree before we wrap at 11 a.m. Central. So Bree, if you want to unmute your mic and go ahead and take over the presentation uh, by sharing your screen, we can get going. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jenny. Uh, all right. Let me get my screen share going here. I think I think I got it. Can you see it? You're good. That's perfect. Yes. All right, excellent. Well, um, first, I just want to say thank you for having me as a guest here. Um, I was laughing when I created these slides because um, if you would have asked me when I was like a kid and I wanted to be a firefighter, if I would be presenting at like a data conference one day, I would have laughed at you. And also, from my perspective, like I appreciate data. I know the power of data, um, but when you start throwing around like the actual technical side of how data processing and data management works, um, I'm really fortunate to have a lot of really great data people around me. So I feel really lucky that I can be a part of the conversation here today and talk about the journey that we've been on. Um, Geisinger has definitely evolved a lot and I was chuckling it um, our, our presentation today says you know Excel to Tableau in two years or three years and now uh, we just went live with Datarama uh, thanks to the really hard work from a lot of people on our team and so our, our evolution has come even further which is pretty exciting uh, and I'm happy to share that so um, I think when I think about like, why am I here? And why are you listening to Brie Pardo and, and what she has to say about data? I wanted to give a little bit of context about who I am. So I am the Director of Digital Engagement at Geisinger. Our team is pretty broad. We cover social media, marketing analytics and insights and digital marketing. And as a department, we have insourced almost everything that we do. Um, and as a result, it's helped us be a lot more agile and a lot more connected to the data than we ever have been in the past. And we'll talk a little bit about that um, on, on today's presentation. Um, marketing CRM was also a part of my purview. So we're just starting to go live. It's been a two year journey to get our customer relationship management system put in place. And that is all about the data. Uh, at the end of the day, if we're not feeding the right information from the right systems, making sure that the quality is uh, as good as it can be, um, then we're not going to get the right message to our customers. And the goal of that 360 degree view becomes really futile. And so it became a partnership where Brie worked in the marketing department, but she became friends with everybody in um, IT and data and apparently also started talking in the third person. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, then in January of this year, we started to talk about Datarama and how it could be the next step for us in our marketing analytics. And so I was fortunate to be able to champion bringing that into the organization as the next step in our tech stack. And as I mentioned, I oversee the team that makes data magic happen. So I'm friends with data wizards. One of them is on the call right now. Hi, Allison. Thanks for being here. Um, and so uh, my job is really block and tackle. What can I do to help you get what you need in order to make that data come to life and really tell the story that our leadership and our organization needs? And it's been a huge part of Geisinger's transformation. So again, happy to be here. Wanted to give some context about why maybe Jenny was interested in having me talk and um, I think we can go ahead and dive in. So what am I talking about today? Um, in the next 40 minutes, uh, we'll talk about our journey to closed loop reporting. 
um, it's been an interesting evolution. And I, I really come back to the, the first time that I actually met Jenny and the Anvil team at HCIC a few years ago. And we had just come off the heels of a presentation from Penn Medicine sharing all of their incredible Tableau dashboards and all of the deep insights that they had into how their data works and how they had implemented CRM and their own data warehouse. And it was like everyone in the audience was drooling. I still remember the Leslie Nope gif that I posted on Twitter of like, I want this. I want this to be our future and I want our department to get there. And it felt so far away and it felt so challenging, but I remember standing in front of that room and saying, challenge accepted. <laughs> like, I want to get there. I want to do it fast. And fortunately, we've had the leadership and the team to be able to support that. But I think um, what was missing from that presentation that would have been super helpful for me was what was the backbone of how you did that and who was the team and what what vision did you have in mind when you were going from zero to 100? Because it's an overwhelming task. The thought of going from having all of this marketing collateral out there to figuring out exactly how it's performing down to the appointment or the member or the pharmacy script level it's a lot to take in and it's a lot to think about. And so what I'm hoping today's presentation helps our friends on the phone and anyone who watches this recording is a little bit of the playbook and the journey that we went on um, to go from Excel and manual scraping of data um, to the much more automated, robust and insightful reporting that we're able to provide today. So let's dive in. Um, when I think about our, our data journey, it really relates back to our organizational journey as a department. Um, four years ago, Geisinger's marketing and communications department was really, really great at billboards and posters. And we worked hand in hand with doctors to figure out exactly what they needed. Um, and we never knew the effectiveness of any of the tactics that we were putting out there. So we were doing things and we were really hopeful that they were making a difference or making a change or driving volume. But at the end of the day, it was the same rinse and repeat work over and over again without any real insight into how we needed to evolve or change to do things better. And Geisinger as a whole sits in an incredibly competitive market right now, as probably many of you on the phone do. We no longer can engage in healthcare in the traditional sense. We are becoming a consumer centric market. And with that comes increased competition and the increased need for marketing to not only be effective at driving people in the door, but to also engage and retain consumers so that they can't think of anything except our services. And we just, we truly didn't have the infrastructure to support it. So we had this crazy tectonic shift happen and I wanted to try and identify one specific thing that made the difference, like one silver bullet that if everybody on this call could have this one thing, then hoorah, you're ready, data's good to go and you'll have that closed loop reconciliation. But it's just not how it worked. There were a number of things that had to happen. So we had new leadership come in the door and they had a firm recognition that we needed to start tracking and we needed to be more effective in the way that we were communicating with our people. And so they really set the vision from the top down. It wasn't just the digital team saying, hey, we need to track stuff or the analytics team that actually didn't exist saying we need to track stuff. But it was an organizational and cultural shift in our department to say, okay, we want to track because we want to do better. And making that adjustment is really challenging, but it's something that with the leadership buy-in, we were able to make that transition. Um, there was also a huge need for organizational alignment, and that extends beyond the reach of just the marketing department. Our leaders and the people that were trusted within our department to reach out became friends with operations, data, IT, legal and compliance from a data use perspective, um, clinical side, health plan side, pharmacy side. As our business continues to grow and expand into new sort of tentacles of healthcare business, we needed to make sure that we were on the front lines 
having conversations with those partners to say, this is what we can do for you, but this is the infrastructure that we need to build in order to get there. And then we had some nice conversations with our team to figure out what sort of data skills, resources, and stack we would need in order to be able to accomplish our goals. Um, and what we really figured out is that in order to do data work, you need data people, which sounds really simple, but we, as in healthcare, we're spoiled with the amount of data that we have about consumers. And Geisinger was one of the first customers that Epic had. So we've been collecting EHR data and consumer data about our patients for over 20 years. And when you start to think about all of the evolution and changes and how we've collected data and what those systems and processes look like, um, it, it gets messy. And so when you think about messy data, you really need people that understand it so that they can help you make that evolution and change. And then the last part was, you know, it's not just having the data. It's not just having the people that can adjust the data or understand and adapt and ingest the data, but it's also understanding that we have to make an investment in technology in order to present that and getting, getting it to a point where it's meaningful. Um, even though we have data people that get the data, at the end of the day, the real power is when you can provide those insights to your partners in operations to say, these are the recommendations that we have and these are the insights behind it so you can drive true organizational change. And so we, we needed to strike that balance behind a mastery of the data, but also understanding how to share it with our, with our partners. So where did that start? Like that slide had a lot going on, right? Um, so three years ago, that leadership came in and we started what was called a toaster campaign. Um, and it really, it started with a gif of the little toaster that could. Um, we needed to change our perspective from the capabilities of launching giant omni-channel campaigns with TV, radio, direct mail, newspaper, um, paid search, paid social. I mean, we can throw the kitchen sink at something, but at the end of the day, it's that little toaster that could with maybe a little bit of search, a little bit of social, a landing page, and a thank you email that um, we can really start to measure, optimize, and change change in a short amount of time and get it off the ground so that we can use those insights to inform what that big campaign really does look like. And so toasters started popping up around the office. People started cutting them out. I think there were some uh, chants going on along, around our marketing strategists about their toasters and how they're going to have an oven and not a toaster. Um, but what it gave us was a little bit of runway to figure out what the data needed to look like in order to measure and report. And the toaster days were when we were going into Facebook, going into Google ads, manually exporting reports, getting them into an Excel spreadsheet, um, doing some nice sum and average formulas to figure out our cost per lead. And, we started there and it, it was a good place. I mean, it was more than we had ever done before. We were capturing forms and calls um, and, and things really started to look a little bit different, but it was the precipice of something very different for the organization. Not only were we measuring and getting things out in market, but we were also holding ourselves accountable for performance. And accountability in a time when your department has never done that before can be scary. But what was really interesting is our partners throughout the organization started to go, wow, maybe I don't need that billboard. Maybe I want this paid search that can magically show up to people who want to see it. And we can tweak and change and optimize that over time. How cool is that? And I'm not going to say we don't get requests for billboards anymore, but I think this was the start of conver a conversation with our with our partners to really show that we had ownership of what we were putting in market and that we wanted it to succeed and that we needed their partnership in order to get it across the finish line. So it, it sounds simple, you know. Um, our team was me. I was our data team <laughs> and it wasn't clean. Um, our lead analyst, Allison, can tell you that we didn't get it right the first time. She did a lot of cleaning when she joined us, but we leveraged the technology that we had. We got information out of Sitecore, our web content management system. 
we started to use CallRail and we used the super slick tool Excel to get us what we needed for that first phase. And within that, we then knew how many leads we were driving, what that cost per lead was, what that cost per lead was by tactic, which was a slight evolution. We started to get some whiz bang technology in our forms to scrape some of those URL query parameters that we all know and love. And it really started to give us a vision for what the path to closed loop marketing could really look like. Uh, we had a lot of gaps. We knew what the flow chart needed to look like, but we didn't actually know what all the boxes were. We just knew that there were arrows and that we needed to figure out how to point them in the right place. And so things started to shift and uh, we were fortunate to be able to evolve our team a little bit and our leadership had the appetite for us to continue to evolve and change so that we could do more. And so then we started to dive in a little bit and uh, we started to talk with our leadership about some of those gaps. And I think probably a lot of people on this call have, have gone through this experience of, you know, you talk with leadership about how far we've come and what we're marketing and how it's working. And, you know, they say, okay, you place the ads, you're gonna collect the data, you're gonna analyze the data and poof, we've got ROI, great job team. And then you start to get into it. And um, that's my dog playing with a leaf blower. She's a big fan of it. Um, it. It doesn't make her look that cute, but boy, when you start to get into the craziness of the, the data infrastructure and what it truly looks like behind the scenes, um, it can feel completely overwhelming. And you really, this was the point where I started to have a conversation with leadership saying, we can't do this without different people and different technology, and we need to do it. So we need to take that gap of getting the ads out there, collecting the data, and then starting to automate to analyze and bringing in people that understand it and that can connect the dots with the right pieces in the organization to pull all of this together. And so that started the next phase of where we were going. And so Allison, our data wizard, joined our team as a, a data and analysis lead, and she got us into Tableau. And we started to be able to pull and extract and clean the data that we had been collecting for the, the first year of work and get it into a way that it was normalized in a data model so that we could pull out on a weekly report what the spend was, what the leads were, cost per lead, and then boom, we figured out appointments. We partnered with the right people to be able to query our data lake to say, if this person has had an appointment uh, after this lead date in this service line, we can attribute that back. And so having that capability really opened the door for us because not only could we see that appointments were coming in, but we could see appointment by tactic. And as, as fun as it is to optimize based on leads coming in, and it, it is a great leading indicator, being able to optimize budget and performance by actual outcomes, that's the sweet spot. And so it was this huge barrier and uh, we'd, we crossed it. And so that was when things started to shift a little bit. Our tech stack started to grow. We added dBeaver, we're tapping Hadoop, we're using Tableau, but that base infrastructure is still there. We're still using Sitecore to collect forms, but the forms are getting more intelligent. We're still using CallRail, but we're starting to play with the notion of naming conventions, which have changed dramatically over time, but we, we wanted that consistency. We wanted to be able to have everything consistent across our channels and our systems so that uh, when we got to that part where else Allison received the data, um, she could do that wizardry without wanting to bang her head against the wall cleaning for too long. And so that was that evolution. We got cost per patient conversion. We got to cost per patient conversion by tactic. And at this point, our department was still really focused only on the clinical enterprise. But then things started to shift at this point 
and I think you're noticing a trend here at Geisinger that things don't stay the same for long. And we started to bring under our purview the marketing for our health plan insurance arm, as well as our pharmacy department. And so looking at cost per patient conversion and patient conversion by tactic was important, but it really needed to scale to all of the other parts of our organization as well in order for us to continue to show value in order to effectively track all of the work that we're doing. So that gets us to this year. You can see some nice screenshots with some fake data of our Datarama dashboards. Um, and, and there's a whole lot under the covers for this. Our tech stack grew uh, significantly in the last year in order to be able to support it. So uh, we added in health cloud, we added in health grades, and we're using those platforms to assist with the automated reconciliation on the health plan side. We also expanded our team. So now our research and analytics lead has a senior research analyst. That's right, two data wizards on the team. And they really balance each other well because we have um, our senior market research analyst is absolutely phenomenal. He comes from an actuary background. And so he's able to understand how the SQL queries work and how the data tables come together and how we can reach into this system and reach into the system and pull it together. And our research and analytics lead has the baseline knowledge of that, but she also adds the layer of translating that into insights and visualizations. So together, when we look at a tool, um, that can support our data requirements, we needed both sides of that spectrum. And so now where we're at today is we can look at the number of leads that we have. We're incrementally building on all the CPL and CPAs, but now we're to the point where we've become friends with our pharmacy colleagues and our call colleagues on the data team in that part of the organization and same with the, the health plan. And so we've gotten to the point where pharmacy conversion is real. We understand cost per acquisition. Member conversion is real. And automation is the best <laughs> because once we set that foundation and we knew what our goals were and we started to establish who we wanted to be as an organization for reporting, then we're able to start to figure out where are all of the puzzle pieces that we can automate and how can we make this a cleaner process and how can we look at all of the different parts of that tech stack, Sitecore, how can we make our landing pages more efficient and all of the naming conventions consistent, CallRail, how can we get all of the naming conventions consistent and everything sorted in companies so that it's easier to ingest via API. Tableau, DBver, Hadoop, how can we work with our systems? Where are the borderlines? Where are the boundaries where we can't automate for things like um, HIPAA and data privacy? But where are the parts where we can automate so that everything is streamlined into one system? And then how can we route all of these insights back into systems like Health Cloud and Health Grades so that that 360 degree profile starts to become realistic? So I wanna talk a little bit about what's next because we've talked a lot about where we are in the journey that we've been on. And I think this is the critical change. This is the critical mass that we're finally able to start to taste smell here. <laughs> we've done so much work to get the data into a place where we can work with it and manage it and share it, but we spend so much time getting to that point, to that foundational effort of having data in a place where we need it to be. And it's not perfect, but we have that foundation and we have that low level um, infrastructure that's required. Now our team can really start to play and figure out the insights so that we can be true partners with our marketing strategy colleagues and our operation colleagues to say, these are the nuance, these are the nuggets that are going to make the difference in our efforts between being good and being the best. And our organization wants the best and we want to give it to them. And so um, 
it'll it'll be a significant shift for us. It'll be a significant shift for us to be able to spend that time diving into the data, understanding what's happening, and then creating real actionable reports that our team can start to work with. Um, but it's it's exciting because this is the fun stuff. Scrubbing thirty thousand lines of data is not fun, even if you do love data. And so we're thrilled to be able to be at the point now where we can really start to make that transition. And then I wanted to share this too. I think it's important to be totally transparent about some of the bumps in the road and the stuff that if, you, if you're not where we are, um, in your journey that hopefully we can help you <laughs> and give a leg up um, so that you can maybe avoid some of the same the same pain that we've had. Um, so I think that one of the most important things is uh, to assume that the data is going to be messier than you think. Um, at the end of the day, data is coming from some sort of activity or human action. Um, it's getting input somehow into a system. It doesn't just magically appear. And so as a result, it's never going to be perfect. And so if you go in and bake your timelines and assume that things are going to take longer and that you're going to have to do some work to figure out the data validation side, um, I think that will be helpful. Um, another component that I think maybe we took advantage of is that naming conventions. Um, it sounds so tactical. It sounds so silly that naming things consistently across systems and understanding how that impacts the overall performance of your analytics and reporting. Um, but it, it makes all the difference. And working with your team and your organization, not only directly within your reporting, area, but maybe also other parts of your department, whether you have creative services or project management, making sure that everybody gets on the same page um, can make the difference between a dashboard or a report taking an hour to build and taking 10 hours to build. And so um, we've become real sticklers in terms of making sure that naming conventions are followed so that the automations that our analysts have built can perform and, and get us what we need. I think another huge part um, that again, we were just sort of running, we were flying while the jet was being built um, is that SOPs are critical to success. Um, we have experienced so much change over the last four years. And I think you can feel it. I hope you can hear it in this presentation that again, sometimes we just ran and without those standard operating procedures, it's really easy to go back and try not, not remember how specific things were pulled or not remember where in the organization certain things sit or how you need to structure the work that you're doing. And so a huge recommendation that I would make is build those out up front. Take the extra week, two weeks to sit with your team and figure out the best way to do something. Um, I think what we learned in the implementation of our, our new platform, Datarama, is the importance of taking the time on the data model and working through that QA um, and then socializing it with the team of why, why we're participating in that as a SOP um, as a best practice and why we'll do it moving forward. And they might not appreciate it necessarily on the front end. Um, the work that goes into data normally never is, but it will pay dividends when they have access to the data at their fingertips. And then um, another big piece here, before you touch data, ask why. So this is healthcare day. Um, all of us, like I said, have access to so much data. It's overwhelming, not only from our digital platforms and marketing platforms, but we know some of the most intimate details about people that we ever could. And so when we start to think about all of the different ways that we could use this data to inform decisions, um, there's a lot of rabbit holes that we can go down and a lot of different ways that you can look at different data. So again, taking a step back, understanding the goal and performance that you want out of the analytics that you're seeking to execute um, is, is really critical and it will save you time in the long run. Um, 
this one might be uh, uh, less popular, I think, overall, but it's made a huge transformation in our department, and that's uh, democratizing access to data and insights. Um, it's, it's very easy to stay in a hole and say, oh, everything is working great, and this is perfect, and we nailed it. Great job marketing. Um, but I think one of the biggest changes and um, fast track efforts in order to show the need for these insights and the need for this work was going out and showing and telling exactly what we were finding. And once we're able to partner more efficiently with operations and other parts of our organization and share, you know, this is the work that we're doing. This is what we're seeing. Are there other ways that we could be measuring this? Are there other ways that we could optimize on the operations side in order to better improve our marketing efforts? Um, the conversation starts to shift and you become more of a change agent instead of just the, the marketing billboard team. <laughs> and I, I think holding yourself accountable for performance and sharing that and letting yourself be vulnerable in the organization when things succeed and when things fail uh, puts you in a position to be a trusted advisor. And um, it, it really is, it's an ongoing change at Geisinger, but I, I think it is something that overall as an, as an industry, it's important for us to be able to talk about those things as well. Um, I've talked about this a little bit, connecting the dots between visuals and the data behind the scenes. Um, it's so critical that, you know, when, when I sit down with our analysts and we look at something and we go, yes, this makes perfect sense. And then we start to share it more broadly and people say, oh, I don't, I don't get this. I don't know why you have two bars here or why are these colors like that? Um, unless the data means something to the people that you want to use it, it really doesn't matter how much work you've done or how much work you've put into it. And so um, taking that step back and taking that time, maybe to socialize with other people, but also to make sure that the visuals are as simplistic and easy to understand as possible um, will be great. I mean, bubble charts are awesome and they're super pretty and I love them, but I have never had anyone in our organization been, been able to understand what they mean or why they matter. And so um, I, I think that's that's a really critical component. There is a visualization in our organization that floats around that has a map that's color coded with pie charts on top of it, little mini pie charts, and nobody knows what that means. And so uh, I think it's easy for us to be able to add on and layer and do more. Um, but what I've learned from our data wizards is we have to take a step back and make it simple and make it easy for people to consume. And then the last piece, um, never stop iterating. Um, we launched a dashboard for our annual enrollment period three weeks ago, and it's probably changed 50 times since then. And that's not a reflection of the dashboard not meeting needs. It's a reflection of more people being a part of the conversation and asking questions. And I think not only from a single project perspective of taking that feedback and being able to provide the information because the data supports it, because we have that data in our back pocket, um, but also just being relentless and wanting to understand and learn more. Um, this is such an industry that supports curiosity and understanding how to do better work and more efficient work. And so I think as a result of that, you just have to keep keep your eye moving forward to figure out what the next step is going to be and and how you can uh, make your make your marketing more effective across every vertical by informing it with data and insights and i know i'm at 11 35 so i'm a little bit early <laughs> i talk fast sorry jenny <laughs> no it's um, awesome I hope that we have I hope so that many questions. Good. Okay, good. Perfect. That's what yeah. I was hoping for. <laughs> we're good. So we've had a lot of questions come in from the audience. So we're just going to start tackling them. So one of the first one is, can you talk about how in-depth your call tracking goes? So unique numbers in emails, ads on the website, just on certain platforms. How have you chosen to structure it? 
Yeah. So that's another thing. I'll be totally an open book. We started, we track everything and it's almost to a point of diminishing returns. <laughs> like there is a line <laughs> where there are too many phone numbers and we've, we've met that. <laughs> so um, it's, it's something that we're working on to figure out what the right components are to track. Um, and it, some of it depends on the campaign and those initial objectives. So if this is a campaign that we're putting out there that's multi-million dollars, omni-channel, we need to be able to turn at the blink yeah. of an eye in order to, to execute, we'll go a lot deeper. Um, but I think for some of our standard practice, a lot of it is just based in the marketing campaigns that are out there and we stay high level based on tactic. Um, that's how deep we go now who knows what will happen in six months or with the next campaign, but I think that's our general <laughs> rule of thumb. <laughs> I love it. Very straightforward. Uh, great answer. What skills and knowledge do you feel your data people must know? I know right now you have a team of two that you were talking about on the last slide. What are skills that you think uh, they possess? And then what do you think as you continue to grow the team are some key areas you want to make sure new hires will have? Awesome. So, I think it's balance. There's soft skills and hard skills, right? So I think hard skills, understanding marketing data, understanding SQL, understanding Tableau and data visualizations and just basic like data theory is important. Mm -hmm. That said, we're also bringing in people that we can learn and grow and develop with. So new grads from college, you don't have to know the whole world and you don't know how to have to, mm -hmm. how, how to code everything in SQL, but, um, we can, we can train you if you have the soft skills of just being generally inquisitive um, and tenacious, willing to dive into a 30,000 yeah. row Excel column without the fear of what's gonna happen on the other side. Um, I think <laughs> those, those aspects and those personality traits are consistent across both members of our team and uh, it's who we'll look for moving forward. Um, but I think as long as you have the basic nuts and bolts, uh, we can get you there as long as you're willing to, willing to dive in. <laughs> I love that answer. I actually had an experience of one of the very first people that I hired and the first analytics team that I built was actually um, a true data scientist. And it was a terrible experience because he had all the hard skills, none of the soft skills, didn't understand business. He understood data like the back of his hand. He could calculate anything, but he didn't know why he was doing it. So <laughs> I love your answer. It's much more practical. Um, how did you decide you needed data Rama? So um, I know that you said you already clearly use Salesforce CRM and Tableau, but how does Datarama fit in? And then why did you invest in them if you had Tableau already? Like what was that pivot point for you? Yeah, so Tableau is a great data visualization tool. Um, Datarama's game changer for us is really their ETL capabilities. So um, they also manage a significant number of marketing APIs. And I don't know if any of you have dealt with the Facebook API, but it changes like every four mm -hmm. days. Um, and it's not something that we had the internal capacity to manage. And so um, being able to streamline our reporting on the insights coming out of those platforms um, and they continue to grow, the number of APIs that they mm -hmm. have available, um, but also having the flexibility to ETL other data sources that we needed into the system to create those connections was really important for us as well. And now that they're both owned by Salesforce, one of the benefits that we'll have is the connector between Datarama and Tableau. Mm -hmm. So Datarama doesn't have HIPAA compliance, so we can't ingest direct PHI, but Tableau can. So if we have the capability to connect the dots there, our visualizations start to become a lot more powerful. So the marketing powerhouse joins teams with the Tableau powerhouse and the clinical pharmacy and member uh, enterprise. And I, I think we'll really start to see some magic happen there. Cool. And let's just give a 101 on what ETL stands for, for anybody who is on this call that doesn't fully know. So are, are you comfortable doing a quick 101? Yeah, sure. So uh, I, I think it's extract, transfer, load. But basically, it's like the data's over here, and we got to get it in here, and we need to figure out mm -hmm. how to pull it out, how to make it work how we need it to, and then yep. push it into the system. Can you tell I'm not an actual data person? I work with data people. <laughs> that was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was so perfect. So it's extract, transform, and load. And sometimes it actually can be ELT or ETL, depending on what process you use within your organization. So 
we run across some situations where it makes more sense to do ELT, and but a lot of the times ETL is more of the term that people have found. But I just think it's important to break that out because a lot of people don't understand when they're just getting into this process that the data doesn't just come in and it's perfect, right? You have to actually <laughs> do things with it to make it worthwhile to use. So that's what the whole ETL process means for any marketers that are just starting to learn about analytics. You're going to learn a lot more about ETL as you start digging into your own personal journey there. Next question. Um, one area you talked about in your most recent phase was around governance, specifically standard operating procedures. Can you tell us more about that process and maybe even give us a high level example of what one of your SOPs would look like? Sure, absolutely. And I think what's important is that the, the SOP that I can give as an example is not just our data team, right? It's all of the other people that are informing the data that's coming in. And so when we think about the standard build for a basic, a toaster campaign, we've got search, social, landing page, we need the call rail tracking, the CRM tracking, um, all of those pieces needed to come together in one consistent space with the same naming convention. Mm -hmm. And so um, our marketing, digital marketing lead created a very simple Excel document where everything can be housed, but everything is drop down. So we're not manually entering things in, all of the naming conventions are consistent yeah. and the formulas come together. And so it became critical that at the start of every campaign that Excel Excel is our source of truth. And so everything can flow through that system. And then anyone who needs to QA or reference later, make sure that everything is working correctly can come back to that document. But we, we talked about all of the different like cool things that we could use or tools that we could make happen. And we're like, no, we just need an Excel spreadsheet. So uh, we haven't moved away from Excel, um, but knowing that that's the first step and that everything yeah. trickles down from that um, has been a game changer for us. Oh yeah, that's a great example. Perfect. Um, let's talk about how you got approach uh, or how you approached getting organizational buy-in to invest in a dedicated analytics team. What did that process look like for you? Yeah, so um, I think it started with our executive leadership coming into marketing and um, starting to see some of the data flowing in and Bree saying, uncle, right? Like we can't, we can't scale this if it's just me. Um, but then we, we reached out actually to our enterprise data team and the collaboration of the positions that we have in our team are actually joint between the two because mm -hmm. our enterprise data team knew that we had this robust silo of data from marketing and they had, you know, everything else. So we wanted to make sure that as we built the team, they had the resources to be successful and access to people that actually understood what they needed to do. So we have the, um, combined reporting structure between the two organizations overall. So they have mom and dad boss, but so far I think it's going pretty well. We're friends, we're not fighting. And so um, I think that was a part of it. Not only were we saying we wanna be accountable for data within our department, but we wanna be accountable for data at the enterprise. Yeah. And once you're willing to expose the level of transparency, people wanna know what you're gonna do with it. And I think that was the next step in getting us to that FTE. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, let's talk about, um, so what are, what's the mix of the work that your analysts perform? So, um, and I know Allison's on the call, so I, I hope I get this right. Um, but I think, I think there's a combination. So uh, some, probably 20% of her time is spent working with stakeholders, understanding the strategy of what we're doing, what the goals are, and how we need to present it. I would say still at this point, probably 30% of her job is cleaning data, understanding data, understanding what needs to happen with it in order to get it where it needs to go. And then I did not do math or write down the numbers that I said, but whatever percentage is left, <laughs> she is spending her time uh, working in the platform, specifically in Datarama, to take some of the data models that Dan is working on, our, our other data wizard, um, to bring mm -hmm. those to life um, and to get them to yeah. the point where they need to be uh, for the organization. And then our other analyst, I would say, 90% of his time is working in Hadoop and Deep Beaver and SQL um, and getting all of the code and the data together to support the initiatives that are that are going on in our department. 
and probably fixing broken data. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> every, Where we can. <laughs> every day. Yes, every day. Okay. Another great uh, participant submitted question is, can you talk more about the challenges you face with HIPAA and data collection and use targeting, for example? Yeah. So um, it's, it's interesting. And I think a lot of different... Um, different organizations interpret HIPAA differently, right? Um, we actually don't do, I think you said specifically youth, we don't do a lot of pediatric targeting. We're targeting moms, we're targeting their, their friends, their husbands, their families. Mm -hmm. um, so a predominant focus for us is the 18 plus. Um, but I think it's that gray area of we have access to the data, but how do we use it without being yucky? And I know that that mm -hmm. word is like so elementary school, but that's sort of like our source of truth in your in our gut. Um, and we we have the capability through opt in to message to these people and to communicate and analyze their data. Um, but there has to be a line where we're making sure that we're putting the consumer first. So. Mm -hmm. That is part of my role on the data team. I think I'm part of that governance of does this make sense and should we be doing this? Yes, we can message, but but maybe we shouldn't. Um, but I, do, I don't think it's black and white for anyone. So I'm sorry, that's not like a great answer. I, I know we do work um, in our health grades platform that helps us in terms of audience insights, building out some of that segmentation and targeting in a cleaner way. Um, but even then, you still have access to the data. You have to know how, mm -hmm. how you want to use it. And I think that's a, that's a leadership decision on, on how far they're willing to go. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one follow-up question I'd love to have is one of the things that you said a couple of times is how you made friends with legal. You went around and made sure that you got great relationships where you could have open conversations and dialogue. And that's something I think a lot of marketing teams within the organ different organizations are really afraid to do because they almost don't want to be caught in doing something bad. So what would you recommend or how would you recommend for a marketer to actually initiate that conversation, start talking about HIPAA compliance if they haven't done that yet? Yeah, and I, for us, it's it's across the board. So we have um, legal and the health plan and legal on the clinical side and both have lots of opinions that are super valuable. But I think the the conversation that we initiated was we don't know what we don't know and we don't wanna break the rules. So how can we be partners? And this is the goal and, and start the conversation with them early. Don't come to them with a finished product and go, okay, can you sign this? <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. We started very early in our conversations and set up workflow um, to have everything reviewed and approved. And so we Perfect. actually have an entire system to make that possible. Um, I think our organization is very conservative in how we handle our messaging. And so maybe we're, maybe that's why we went to legal so much earlier than, uh, than maybe other organizations. But I think for the most part, the culture for us has been one of collaboration and partnership. And I don't know about other people, but I would rather know before I get a legal fine <laughs> if it's coming. So uh, I, exactly. I think- Exactly. Just being open and transparent about the fact that you don't know what their job is, but also that you want to bring value to the organization, and mm -hmm. this is why, um, that, that definitely helped us. I love it. That's a, a, a beautiful approach and way to walk into it in a way that everybody can be comfortable. What are you most looking forward to in the next few years? So, um, I, I think we, it's that one slide, right? It's the data to insights. <laughs> We are building the foundation. We are getting so close to being in a really good place where we have a lot of this stuff automated. And I think now it's time for us to have that next tectonic shift of, okay, now we've done all the work. We've got the friends, we've got the technology, we've got the people, um, but now how do we really start to take a look at the marketing that we're doing and make really good informed decisions? Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's hard right now because it's, it's easy to do the postmortem. It's easy to look at things at the end of the campaign and say, what could we have done better and apply it moving forward? It's not easy to do it two weeks into the campaign or historically yeah. it wasn't. And I think that next level of transformation is um, what I'm most excited about now. Very nice. Let's see. If you could expand your team or tech stack, what would you add? Oh, so um, I think, 
so right now we have all of this, we have this fabulous data wizard that is great at automating and building scripts, but mm -hmm. sometimes he does get bogged down um, at the next tier of work of building lists for direct mail or pulling data from different sources and bringing it together. And some of the more operational work that is like mm -hmm. data, <laughs> like, it is it's important yeah. and we need it but it's not totally there and so if we can add another team member that can help support that side of the house of the block and tackle side so that they can really run in getting automation up and going and support yeah. our lead in getting um sort of the connected dots across some of our operational dashboards and performance metrics that would be my dream state. Now, ask me in two weeks and I'll probably have something else that I want to add because my <laughs> list for Santa for my team is pretty long. <laughs> um, but today that's that's sort of where my head is at. Yeah. Do you have any software you'd want to add or any tools? So at, at this point, no. Allison probably has something awesome. on her list. Um, but yeah. what I'll say is we are working through the change management on the on the tech stack that we've evolved already. And we went live with yeah. Datarama like three weeks ago. So I think, um, yeah, ask, ask me soon, maybe next year. Yeah, <laughs> get comfortable with it first. Okay, and then last question is, are there any training resources you recommend for someone in the marketing role that wants to become more analytic savvy? I'm asking this question for all presenters. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, I think there's a lot of really great free resources out there. Google Analytics, Google, I think you mentioned that on the last call. Google yeah. provides everything, dive in and understand mm -hmm. that. Um, Tableau has some really low cost certifications mm -hmm. that you can do. Um, and Datarama has their whole university where you can get certified there and start to play in their platform. Um, and so I think some of those pieces that are low hanging fruit and easy to understand uh, yeah. would be a, a great place to start. I love it. Well, uh, thank you so much, Bree. This presentation was phenomenal. I loved all the audience engagement and all the submitted questions. So thank you so much for your time. And for everyone else, we're going to take um, just a couple of minute break. We're going to get started in seven minutes at top of the hour. And we have uh, Mike McCaster, he is actually a data ROM account executive on the healthcare and life sciences side. And then Allison Erfer from Geisinger, she is actually on Bree's team. She's the manager of research and analytics. And so they're going to be talking about the data ROM platform itself and then a little bit about how Geisinger has leveraged it um, within their overall marketing tech stack. So it should be a really good real life case scenario that we'll walk through. So thanks, everyone. See you back soon. Thank you.